in uh, the mid-80s, two GSB folks, a professor and I think a doctoral student, assembled work they published on companies that were great for generations. And their thesis was that those companies couldn't depend on any single person, product, or business. Instead, they had to build a culture that enabled them to be great for generations. So I think particularly now in the future that's ahead of us, one key element of that is the ability to build a culture that regularly invents new businesses. Because there's no way any company of the future can rely on any one product or business or team. The world's changing too fast. So that's the subject of my talk today. This is actually a talk that I put together for a large group of CEOs who are trying to understand how to drive new business invention in their companies. And I basically just assembled most of it from slides we use inside Intuit where we teach new business invention. In doing this, I uh, consulted with America's best-read author on business now. Uh, no, not uh, Clay Christensen. Um, Dilbert. And here is, uh, according to that expert, the way to invent new businesses. Can everyone read the, can you read the box in back? You can. And I like the way the machine is spitting on the marketing guy. Uh, <laughs> so that's one way. Before I describe some more uh, the toolkit that we use and uh, some examples, uh, three slides on Intuit for background. Um, basically, our view of success is this. It's a three-step process that you have to do in this order. First, our job is to build a great place for our people and create a high-performing organization for our people. When we do that right, and only then, then we can do right by our customers by inventing the great place, the great, the better ways to live, and then delivering them in ways that delight our customers, so they go out and tell their friends. When we do that right, then we can delight our shareholders. Today we're going to spend time on that point. Now this is important because it's also it's not only the way we please our shareholders; it's important to our sense of self-identity, to our mission. Because our my view of the world is that we're here on the planet to do this, to change people's lives so profoundly. They can't imagine going back to the old way. And it also, I think, contributes to why in, a, in Fortune's list of most admired companies, they rank Intuit as the most admired software company in the US. Now, this might cause you to think that everything works great and we're smooth, finely oiled machine. I just wish it were so. Unfortunately, new business invention is never that clean. It's pretty messy. And here's an example of how we uh, invented our fourth product, which is QuickBooks. Uh, go to the launch of QuickBooks, we knew we'd have some challenges because we had a product with a new name, with a higher price than the market leader and about half the features of the market leader. We didn't know, but we quickly learned we had bad advertising. Here's the ad. <laughs> yeah, now keep in mind, this is to sell accounting software. <laughs> and yes, these are bombs dropping. That is a bald-headed lady and a family on pogo sticks. And you can guess how this ad worked. We got four responses, count them. But in addition to that, we, we found other problems. We had bugs, not just minor bugs. Uh, business would enter all of their business data for a few weeks or months, and then one day, poof, it was all gone. <laughs> all gone. So people, that gave us tech support hell. People called, and they weren't happy. Um, so this was the great launch of QuickBooks uh, in 1992. Uh, fortunately, the team got right on it. The engineers found the root causes of the vanishing data, and we sent out new disks to everybody, and we doubled the size of the tech support department in a week to handle all the calls coming in. Training was pretty easy because we only had to train them on one question. Uh, you know, where the bleep is my data? Uh, so now what happened? Our goal, if we, we thought, if we did our jobs right, we thought within two years we might catch up to the market leader. So now let's look at what actually happened. This shows market share for the first year after we went on the market. These are the existing competitors. There were about two that were tied for market leadership. And this is QuickBooks. Again, this is share of retail sales. This was stunning, unbelievable. Um, 
in the first month, we passed all the existing competitors in sales, and we never, ever got closer to them than two to one. We pulled the advertising, wasn't doing any good anyway. And so we, and we had to fix some of the problems, so the share kind of dwindled down. But, you know, we got to a 50% share and never really went below that. What happened? It certainly wasn't our brilliant launch. Uh, I can tell you that. It wasn't the advertising. It was something far more fundamental. We basically discovered an important but unsolved customer problem that no one else had addressed that we solved well. Uh, here's what happened. We had a product out called Quicken. We found out by accident that much of the users, many of the users, were businesses. We ignored that because we built Quicken as a home product. We ignored the fact that all these businesses. In fact, it got to be half the users were businesses, and we ignored it. Finally, it bugged me. So we went out to figure out why were these businesses using a home product. And in that, we discovered something that we can do a little market research right here to understand. How many people here have taken accounting? Raise your hand. Great. How many people loved accounting? Okay, good. There's always a few. Our finance department is looking for people. Um, <laughs> but most people, and virtually everybody in small companies, doesn't know accounting and hates it. These are the people who think that General Ledger was a World War II hero. <laughs> Unfortunately, the entire rest of the software industry had done nothing but flog accounting software that you had to love accounting to run. Debits, credits, journals, ledgers, posting and closes. And the vast majority of small businesses had to keep books but couldn't operate that software. We discovered this virtually by accident and then set about to build the product for this audience. So we learned that most businesses hate and can't do debit and credit accounting, and so with QuickBooks, we built the first accounting software with no accounting in it. <laughs> that turned out to be the crucial thing, because that solved the A number one problem. And take away the QuickBooks specific stuff, and this is the essence of entrepreneurship. Find something really important to customers that's unsolved, and solve it well. Entrepreneurship is that intersection in the center. And that's basically the process that we set up in our culture to nurture entrepreneurs within Intuit to invent new businesses. And this is so powerful that done well, it can overcome even a really shitty launch like we had with QuickBooks. We talk about it this way, three things, find the important customer problem, solve it well, and do it in ways where you think you can build durable competitive advantage. The reasons for each of these is Peter Karpus, one of our leaders, says if you want to invent a big business, solve a big problem. If you want a little business, solve a little problem, but we don't like those. Um, competitive advantage. You know, if you don't have competitive advantage, business is hell, and it's no fun. If you do have competitive advantage, you can build uh, market shares of 50, 60, 70, 80 percent, as we have in our businesses, and that's a lot more fun. Now, we talked about the first year in QuickBooks. Now we can look at the 13 years since launch, and it's developed one heck of a business. But this hasn't been just one invention. In fact, there have been a series of inventions that have helped spur this growth of new business services like payroll, of new uh, products. For example, we'll look at one of these. This is the engineering team behind QuickBooks Online Edition. It's a totally separate code base aimed at doing online business really well. We, didn't, we weren't the first out, but we we're certainly the biggest now in terms of number of users, thanks to the efforts of that small team. And in fact, it's one of our online businesses that makes Intuit, I believe, the largest ASP-hosted um, business in the world for which people pay money. There's other people who give stuff away free, but for people who actually pay money for services delivered entirely hosted, buy no software, we have uh, far more customers. Just for comparison, Salesforce.com has 17,000 customers. We have over 4 million last year who pay. So now how does this sort of stuff happen? In the talk I gave for CEOs, I asked the question that each CEO should ask, which is, what kind of company are you building? Particularly, what sort of model of invention do you have and display in your company? There are different models. One is the Thomas Edison lone genius model, that, you, that great inventions come from a solo genius out working alone. Unfortunately, that doesn't correlate with business success very well. And in fact, Thomas Edison never produced a successful business. And he was so envious of Henry Ford, who actually did produce a successful business, but Edison never did. Another popular in some Silicon Valley companies is the boss is the genius and tells everybody else what to do. Uh, maybe I'm not bright enough to do that one, so we don't do that one. Another popular in Redmond is to copy competitors' inventions. 
Why run the risk of trying to invent new things when you can just copy? And this is actually not a bad business model. Another is the uh, uh, Xerox Park or AT&T Bell Labs approach to cloister the geniuses in some ivory tower and hope they'll invent things that are useful. And you know what happens there. The company kind of goes its way. The loonies kind of go their way. And if there are good inventions, they are generally brought to market by someone else, as was the case with Xerox Park. The approach that I favor is to have teams in the company that are driven, inspired by customers. Now, I don't have a really good drawing for that one. Uh, it doesn't draw very easily, but it, basically you generally have people at the edges of the company who are closest to the customer, working closely with customers to understand their problem and figure out how we're going to solve it. This is reproducible. You can do this at multiple places in the company simultaneously. It's typically done by people whose titles are engineers or product managers. But it's not limited to that. If you have the right greenhouse culture for nurturing invention, uh, we've had people who were brand managers and marketers come up with the essential insights. We've had even people from the finance department. Um, so it's not in people from sales. It's not limited to any individual. But it's generally people who are closest to customers. Because those are the people who are best able to understand deeply the customer problem that's unsolved and then figure out how to muster the technology to solve it. So how does this work? Well, it starts with a lot of humility. Uh, if you think, go into this thinking you understand customers and you know what's going on, you have a set of blinders that's going to keep you from really seeing what's going on with the customer. Think about all those accounting software companies. We weren't the first to do accounting software. We were about the last. There were about two dozen companies who were already in the market selling accounting software to small businesses. None of them saw what was the A number one problem that customers had using their own product. In fact, half of the accounting software sold at the time was returned by its buyers back to the store because the customers couldn't operate it. And yet the people making that software never saw that because they started with a set of assumptions, a set of beliefs they believed were right. One is that accounting software should do accounting, the stuff that accountants do. And so they never questioned. They never had the clear eyes to walk in the customer's shoes and see the insight that became readily apparent if you started with no assumptions. So you've got to start with humility. Humility is saying, I don't understand the customer, and I'm going to go learn. And it takes real empathy. You have to be able to walk in their shoes. There's a great Indian proverb that summarizes this well. Empathy is not just about walking in someone else's shoes. First, you have to remove your own shoes. First, you have to get your assumptions out of the way. Now, there's a more modern American translation of this. I don't like that one. So how do we try to walk in the customer's shoes? Uh, we have a lot of techniques that we teach and practice in the company. Uh, one in particular, a thing called we, we call follow me home observations or follow me to the office. And you see this. Here's a, one of our engineers in Bangalore doing that. This is to actually go to the customer's site, to their home, to their office, and watch the customer or the prospect do their work. Watch their and just sit and watch. And you see things you could have never imagined. That you, and they would, they would never tell you. Uh, P&G has some experience with this. They used to, when I was there, really focus on quantitative research surveys. And they ran, and they've learned since, you've got to do this. Uh, for example, one of the surveys that they ran in the laundry business, and they're big, and it covered lots of topics, and one was the ease with which you could use the, the box, the detergent box, and the ease of opening and all that. And that got good scores in the quantitative market research. But then they later had some researchers actually go and watch women do laundry, mostly women, I guess. And they found that they, it was fairly op easy to open the tied box if you had a screwdriver close at hand. And many women kept a knife for a screwdriver, and they would jam the box open to get the thing open. P&G had never discovered that through any quantitative research. Only by watching did they see that. Here's an example from an entirely different industry. Victoria's Secret, they make fancy underwear. Uh, their share, very successful, but their share was flat at 20%. After a few years, they didn't like that, so they commissioned a bunch of work. Some of that research work was to do follow me home research. In this case, it was follow me to the lingerie drawer. They went to women's homes and had the woman go to the drawer and paw through it, describing why she wore various things and when and why. What they discovered was that Victoria's Secret's products weren't even considered 
for the vast majority of wearing occasions because they were deemed to be uncomfortable. Now, I don't have any personal knowledge about this, but I'm <laughs> taking it on faith. From. So this, and this is something Victoria's Secret had not understood. So this inspired them to do something very different. They put together a whole new team to solve the comfort problem. And they came out with a new line called Body by Victoria. And what I'm told is it has a special two-way stretch fabric, and it's seamless. It does not have seams. And that produces a far more comfortable experience. That's enabled them to virtually double their share. Now, this is an old, mature business. You don't see this sort of share change. And Body by Victoria is now Victoria's Secret's most popular product line. There are great pictures, by the way, at victoriasecret.com, but this is a family <laughs> show, so uh, you'll have to do that on your own. So this is another example of follow me home research and the importance of understanding the important customer problem. Often I use the phrase as a synonym, synonym for important customer problem, I use the word pain point, and maybe in Victoria's Secret's case it actually was. Okay, second point, study customer behaviors. Watch them with your own eyes. Trust what they do much more than what they say. Here's an example. This is a product we came out with in the 90s called the Quicken Financial Planner. It responded to a very well-known problem, uh, and that is that Social Security is not going to be sufficiently able to fund the retirement of people of my generation and after, like it did for my parents. Uh, there was a survey done by someone else in the 90s, and they interviewed people and found that more Americans under, I think it was 50, believed in UFOs than believe that Social Security would be there for the retirement. Now, they're right, because there might be UFOs, but there is no way Social Security will adequately fund your retirement. So they're actually more right than you think. This was the product designed to solve that, because a lot of people were worried. They knew they didn't know if they were saving enough. They would have to save enough. They'd have to invest it right. This was, we had a great team, great product. You'd answer simple questions like the TurboTax interview, and then it would show you whether you are going to have enough money to fund your retirement or whether you weren't. And then you could play with variables easily and change this curve to that curve and see what you'd have to change. By the second version, it did college planning as well. It had the cost and expenses of every college and university in the United States in it. It would inflate them at the rate of college inflation, which is, as you know, is about three times that of the inflation rate. Um, it was a really a super simple, great product. We launched it. There were some other competitors out. We got a 95 share by the second version. We've never had a share that high. QuickBooks is close, but not quite that high. And yet, we only got a measly $2 million in sales. We just couldn't grow the category. We got almost all the business there was, but there was almost no business. In the, we, we, tried, we tried multiple versions. We put stuff on the web to see if we could give it away free on the web. We just couldn't get people to use it. In the post-mortem, the product manager at the time said, you know, we should have been suspicious. We had a clue. When it came to put focus groups together, focus groups of people who'd done financial plans themselves, we had trouble finding enough people to even fill a focus group. It turns out we would built a great solution to do something that people just don't do. They may go to a broker and have that guy do a plan, but people don't do their own financial plan. But we had trusted their words. Because if you ask them in surveys or in interviews or focus groups, they'll tell you, oh, I would, I should, I could. Lesson, don't, try, don't trust I would, I should, I could. Trust behavior. If they're not doing it and actively trying to find a solution, don't bother. So trust observable behavior. You can observe in data or with your eyes, not customers' attitudes alone. Okay, third point. Run the company so that the customer is boss. Because if you don't do that, the finance department will run it as if the shareholder is boss. Because there is a brilliant, simple metric for the shareholder, and that's profits. And everyone knows that measure. And that measure will overcome your company, and people will start making bad decisions for customers because the fence department has such a clear and obvious measure. So the only way to fight this is with leadership from the top and an equally simple, powerful measure. We use something called Net Promoter. We ask our customers, every product line, every business group, ask their customers, would you recommend this to a friend? We don't ask if you're satisfied. That's too low of a task, too low of a bar. We ask a higher test. Would you recommend this product or service to a friend? Scored on a 9 to 10 scale. The 9s and 10s we count as promoters. We ignore the 8s and 7s, and we subtract the detractors from the promoters to get a net score. This is a tough measure. And then what happens is the teams automatically start improving because they want to drive that score up. And when we act on those things that drive net promoters, that wows our customers. 
and that removes detractors. And then customers tell their friends and buy more, and that grows our business. And like shampoo, you kind of lather, rinse, and repeat. <coughs> Fourth one, learn by doing, not by planning. Peter Drucker, who died recently, is probably the world's uh, longest writing business author. And his book on innovation is tremendous. He says that, and one of the points is that innovations are rarely right at launch. And they need a lot of change after launch. So go in agile and listen to customers so you change them. And what that means is don't spend a lot of time in advanced planning. Uh, and that's been true in all, every major success that uh, I know of. You know, PayPal, which was a huge success and was sold for a billion and a half dollars to eBay. The PayPal that was successful was their third attempt. The first two were total failures. Their first one was PDA to PDA money transfer, beaming money between PDAs. That's what they built the company to do. Well, totally failed. They had never dreamed of internet auctions and being the payment system for auctions. In fact, they, when, the customer, when a customer started asking them to do it, initially they said no. So innovations are rarely right at launch. So leave lots of room for adjustment. And don't put a lot of faith in an early plan. In fact, every one of our great failures had great spreadsheets. Awesome spreadsheets showing the business going like this. So I found that spreadsheets have no correlation with success in new business. And so I tell our teams, don't spend time on the spreadsheet finance wants you to do. Take five minutes, give it to them, and ignore it. And get back to figuring out what's the important problem and how we're going to solve it well. And lastly, make the company a greenhouse for nurturing entrepreneurs. We have a set of stuff we do to help, a green light process to help green light and speed uh, entrepreneurial ideas, to help the entrepreneur improve them, and to keep management and the finance department off their back. Um, yeah, often the biggest problem in innovation companies is management. As Peter Drucker said once in an Austrian accent that I can't quite imitate, well, you know, the bottleneck is always at the top of the bottle. <laughs> Here's an example. This is uh, Dan Robinson, engineer in the Quicken team. He had a child born with uh, a massive problem. Uh, the first year of life, uh, a million, over a million dollars, a million two hundred thousand in medical bills. Now, there wasn't a cash problem here, and to its insurance paid for it. But he had a medical billing problem, because he had to figure out all these medical bills. And if you've seen how, yeah, in PPO insurance, the massive amount of bills, statements, things that come to you saying, this isn't the bill. And, and you can't figure out who you're supposed to pay, what, what's the insurance company supposed to pay, did they? I'm getting dunning notices now from credit and collections agency, but I thought the insurance was supposed to, it is a mess. He saw that firsthand. And he became passionate that there has to be a solution here. This is an important problem we can solve. Now, I have to admit, I didn't think so. I was not a fan of this. Um, turns out his division manager wasn't. But we have a process that he went through that keeps senior management off your back and gives you a chance to figure out whether and answer the key questions. His work answered all the key questions, so we launched it. The first of what is going to be a series of healthcare initiatives, ultimately linking the consumer up with their healthcare providers in a way that turns all that gibberish uh, into stuff that makes sense and automatically handles this. Probably best to go back to the customer, and if the video here works, we'll hear from uh, the customer experience. We didn't have a little girl in December, and just so happened she was born with a, a chromosomal disorder, and found out she's one of 25 people in the world with this particular disorder. It's like, wow. Nine months later, ten months later, found out that my prostate cancer had reoccurred. So now we're dealing with Annie's stuff and my stuff. And one of the things that was has been overwhelming for us is just dealing with the uh, explanation of benefits and the medical bills. I open them immediately. Enter in and quicken the medical expense manager. I always know exactly where I'm at when it comes to whether or not I owe how close I'm getting to an out-of-pocket expense, being over, over the top of out-of-pocket expense, uh, when I owed something my, or have a refund coming. And the, the key for me is when I have to call the insurance companies and deal with them, I'm able to say exactly, looking at who the, uh, who the provider was, who the person in the household was that had a particular service, and be able to dial that in. And, boy, I, I just can't even imagine what... Uh, you know, what, what it will do for other people, what it's done for our family. I'm sure there's lots of other people in our same situation. Thank you for your time today.